Hello and welcome to today's special webinar, Maximizing Insights, Minimizing Infrastructure, Optimize Running Splunk with Nutanix. Today's event is sponsored by Nutanix and produced by Actual Tech Media. My name is David Davis and I'm excited to be your moderator for today's event. Now before we jump into it, there's a little bit of housekeeping we need to cover. First off, I want to say that we want this to be a very educational event. If you have questions about hyperconvergence, about Splunk, about how you can maximize your infrastructure in your data center, this is the event for you. And we want you to get all your questions answered. We have our expert presenters from Nutanix standing by to answer all of your questions. So we encourage you to use the GoToWebinar control panel to ask as many questions as you'd like using the questions box. We will be answering questions throughout the event and we'll also have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of the event. Now, one lucky prize winner on the live event will be winning a Tango $300 gift card. The Tango gift card can be exchanged for gift cards at big name retailers like Walmart, Best Buy, and Apple, as well as restaurants, and you can even donate it to charity. It never expires, and you can learn about the prize terms and conditions at our website, events.actualtechmedia.com. I'm sorry if you're watching this event on demand. The drawing has already occurred. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's presenters. They are Mr. Greg White, Solutions Marketing Principal at Nutanix, and Mr. James Brown, Solutions Architect for Data Analytics and AI at Nutanix. And yes, you will see a live demonstration of running Splunk on Nutanix during this event, so make sure you stay tuned for that. And without further delay, I'll hand it over to our presenters, Mr. Greg White and James Brown. All right, thanks so much. James and I are excited to be here and uh, really uh, excited to dive deep here into Splunk and running that on Nutanix. And what are we going to cover? What are some things that, that you'll be able to take away from this and, and put to work uh, in your everyday activities? Is For those that, that, that aren't familiar with HCI, we're going to start off and uh, just make sure that there's some familiarity with hyperconverged infrastructure and this idea of how that can be a platform for running different workloads, one of which, uh, and the one we'll be focused on here, uh, is Splunk, obviously why you would even do that, you know, what's special about the way Nutanix does uh, hyperconvergence and enterprise cloud, and so we'll talk about that. Uh, and then we really want to focus on addressing those challenges in your Splunk environment that you're looking for, that when we talk to uh, users out there, the, the challenges that they're looking to solve, uh, what are the steps that, they, that you can take to really make um, Optimize for performance, make this really hum uh, for your Splunk environment. What's a real world example look like? And then uh, we're going to go through uh, a nice demo at the end so you can just really get a real feel for what that's like. So we'll start off and just level set about talking about hyperconvergence and Splunk. You know, there are different ways to run Splunk this day, today. You can run in the Splunk cloud, you could run it on public cloud, uh, and you can run it on premise. And traditionally, on premise has been dominated often by, you know, by the uh, bare metal instances and some of the those kinds of approaches, server sand type approaches as well. And there are pros and cons to, you know, each of these. And, and uh, some customers may use hybrid models uh, as well. But what we want to do is talk about, you know, the, the values that people find in each one and how that plays out. Uh, in an in on-premise hyper-converged kind of approach. So we're going to be focused on talking about the on-prem piece. We will spend a little time talking about hybrid and how you can leverage the public cloud for some aspects and then but keep uh, most of your your workload on-premise uh, and then flex to the to public cloud sometimes as well. But when it comes to on-premise, you know, the big choice that most people have and they talk through is, you know, whether to virtualize or not to virtualize and, and you know, a legacy of bare metal or using SAN and NAS um, for that. There's some aspects of that that um, it's a known quantity. People have kind of figured out how to do it, but it, it creates some complexities. There's some extra costs and uh, silos and some things that happen. Uh, and then it can be kind of tough on, you know, calculating them and getting the performance tuned right. 
from a virtualized standpoint, you have the ability to really simplify that provisioning and the management. Uh, it gives you a lot more flexibility in how you operate. Uh, you're able to better manage jobs and, and um, workloads within those, the resources of those VMs. Uh, and you're able to be more efficient because you're you're putting more workloads onto um, onto that that infrastructure in a more flexible and, and better optimized way. The, the benefits that virtualization brought. Is there anything I've missed on there, James? That you you think is also something worth highlighting? No, we're good to go so far. Okay. So as we talk about virtualizing, so you you going to run Splunk on prem. You, you want to virtualize it. Uh, there's been these layers of complexity that um, really operate throughout the life cycle of, of how you deploy your infrastructure from when you buy it to managing it to upgrading it and ultimately to refreshing. And you know this this is not unique to Splunk, but but we see this uh, as we talk to people that are looking to run Splunk on uh, you know this next generation of infrastructure. And they're trying to get around some of the complexities that have come from it, the infrastructure side, uh, this time to provision, having multiple points of failure, uh, having to manage different um, vendors and pieces uh, and, and try and put all this together. There's complexity around uh, from a people standpoint. So people have to spend a lot of time managing this they're not getting time to work uh, on innovating and you know the reason we titled this you know maximizing your insights and, and minimizing the effort on on your infrastructure is uh, that's the idea there if you can take away that time for the infrastructure and focus on gathering the insights uh, that's gonna help alleviate some of that uh, or give you more opportunity for innovation and a lot of these layers require specialists if you can have a generalist that could cover more and then have, allow people to do other things that are more focused on the application, that's going to bring a lot of benefits, something that people have been looking for but had trouble finding uh, with this approach. And then finally, there's complications when it goes to process. You know, this is difficult to scale, it's difficult to upgrade. Uh, there's a large upfront cost that then you have to grow into, you have to figure out, you know, build for you know your end game and and grow into it or you might if you have a pilot project it might be real hard to then scale that up uh, as it gets bigger and so all of this complexity is what was really behind the idea of of trying to solve this and do, and do it through software do it through hci take all these pieces turn it into a common pool defined by store but defined by software uh, and put it on just a uh, repeatable server node uh, and then scale those nodes. You just kind of keep add nodes into this pool uh, and grow over time. And all you need to do is then have this, this uh, common pool of resources for the application. You can really focus on the app and not really even have to worry about uh, managing all those different pieces of infrastructure. And so what does that really look like? That's this idea that I've got server, I've got, you know, I've got compute, I've got storage, I've got built-in data protection, uh, all as a part of those resources. And then I use that software to layer on the networking management, to layer on the virtualization piece, uh, to put in some of this app automation and orchestration, uh, lifecycle management. So uh, if I need another indexer or I need uh, another search head, then it's fairly easy for me to take a blueprint and de deploy another one of those uh, servers uh, in a virtualized way. And then managing all of this, um, all contained within software, within that kind of common node that, that I just highlighted. So that's really the level set for, you know, what's HCI, um, what are some of the things that, that make it a value when it comes to Splunk. Uh, and how that can be leveraged uh, to really change what you're doing from an infrastructure standpoint, how you run Splunk to allow you to really focus more on on the application and what and what you can do with it. Uh, so I'm I'm going to ask James also, you know, is there anything you know that I missed that you think we should highlight here on this piece on HCI and how we got here, and or should we jump right on into the challenges? Yep. 
Yep, let's go ahead and let's jump onto the next piece because I've got a couple of slides coming that'll actually jump into this a little bit more. So let's continue okay. on the process. Perfect. So why don't you tell me, uh, tell us a little bit about what are, what are the things that you see when it comes to, you know, deploying Splunk out there in the real world? So yeah, it's, there's always challenges out there. Any technology, any piece that needs to be integrated, all these pieces have challenges. Splunk has a little bit of a different set of challenge just because Splunk itself is usually on bare metal today, exactly like Greg said earlier. So downtime with physical servers is a huge piece. If the physical server goes down, you're waiting for parts to be shipped, you're waiting for pieces to come in, or you're waiting for a technician to come on site depending on what your support terms are with the company of choice. Um, you're running out of capacity because when you built that original infrastructure, that infrastructure was size four X. Well, that size we ran basically up to that X amount and we can't go any further. The only way to go any further is one, we can increase it a little bit or we just build a whole new infrastructure call that a forklift upgrade, which actually goes into the third part, which I just kind of skipped over. AWS is always too expensive. I talk to clients daily that are like, this, this AWS piece, it's nice, it's scalable, we can use it, but it's really costing me a lot of money. What can you do to help us change this piece? Um, resources being maxed out, getting, getting to a point to where Splunk was probably original. Splunk was designed for a small piece of, say, four CPUs and, and 24 gigs of RAM, but it's just getting bigger. As they push more data to it, it's requiring more resources. And the new CPUs have more resources and, and abilities and features I want to take care of. So I need to do something about that. And then also the searches and reports take a long time. Some of these searches could take hours, they could take days. Um, and I've seen them even take longer than that. And usually they run batch processes for those. Let's go ahead and jump to the next slide. So why run Splunk Enterprise on Nutanix? So Splunk has multiple pieces to it. Their enterprise version is kind of the starting piece to it. They also have a enterprise security version, which is just made for the security portion of it. But we'll, we'll just focus on the enterprise version today. So why, why Nutanix, why this? We've got a faster time to value. I talked about the forklift before. That forklift transfer could take months, if not 12 months, 16 months. It really doesn't make a difference. Nutanix, with the clustering ability and the way we do it, can have a cluster up and running in less than four hours. And from that time, then you start to do the install of the Splunk and you're ready to go. So we're reducing that piece. But that same piece, we go into the reducing the footprint. We don't have to have a SAN. We don't have to have the storage for the SAN. We don't have to have the three tier. Or let's look at the physical or the bare metal pieces. We don't have to have these old big servers anymore. So we're taking those servers away too of just putting it into a nice little pretty 2D rack. Depending on which models we go to, we can do uh, a more condensed version with two nodes per, but that's all fine. Ease of management. This is, this is a really key piece of Nutanix. We talk about single pane of glass all the time. The ease of managers allows us to look at everything that's going on within the single pane of glass. There's also another piece in there called LCM. It's our lifecycle management. This is huge. Lifecycle management in normal worlds of hardware or virtualization, or it doesn't make a difference. The pieces of, okay, I've got SATA controllers, I've got uh, SCSI controllers, I've got BIOS updates, I've got all these updates that I need to do, okay, I can't really do this. I need to go out and spend a couple of days, a couple of weeks to go research, okay, what version is compatible with which versions? Do I need different software drivers? When can I take this down? With Nutanix, it's easy. We use our product, which is LCM, and it actually goes through and it does it all for you. It's all controlled. It goes, oh yeah, you need this update for your BIOS? Would you like me to do this for you? And it does it in a very minimal downtime. Um, we have predictable and linear growth. So you start with one piece, which includes compute, memory, and hard drive. As you grow and expand, you just add another node. So there's no need of doing this forklift upgrade that we keep talking about, or, okay, I need to go buy 12 or 15 servers, then I've got to build them, I've got to bring them into the cluster. It's just, it's an overhead of work that's just not needed. The other piece that I want to touch on is the quick searches and indexes. Today we follow 
Splunk's best practices is we're able to do a one terabyte ingest. We've got reads and writes of, of 12, 1200 IOPS roughly is what Splunk recommends. We can do a lot better than that. What I've seen out in the field today is our indexing rate can go to a terabyte. I've also seen two terabyte per note. Our indexes are coming back two to three times faster on Nutanix and bare metal or other three tier infrastructures. So we're seeing a good piece of performance coming from the way we do our tiering. Next slide, please. So we're, oh, one more back. There we go. How Nutanix addresses the, the key demands. And I talked about the ability to ingest gigabits per day. I talked about the one, per, one terabyte a day in data. Uh, the quick search, search capabilities, and that's the way we do our auto tiering between our SSDs. So we can do hybrid nodes, we can do full SSD nodes, or we can also do partial populated NVMe nodes. With that, we have the ability to support growth and data ingest. So that's back to that linear scalability. All we have to do is just add another piece of hardware. You've got more memory, you've got more uh, CPU, and you've got more hard drive. We also have nodes out there that are just what we call storage only nodes. They're made as just a, a hard drive repository. They've got very little CPU and memory because we're not gonna use it for the performance that's needed with indexers. And everything is self-contained. This goes back to this ease of management. I don't have to have a guy that knows this specific piece of hardware. I don't have to have a, a person that specializes in this SAN infrastructure or this storage uh, network infrastructure. It's all in one piece and one person or persons, depending on how it's managed and how big the organization is, can take care of this. Next slide. What steps can be taken? Splunk recommends a one physical to one virtual CPU ratio. I stick by this very, very hard, very, very much so, just because of we want to give you the, the best possible performance for what you're getting. So we stick to a one-to-one. -one. And this can be adjusted depending on your Splunk reps. We work directly with them to make sure that, hey, here's what your daily ingest is, here's what you're holding for your hot, your warm, your cold, and your frozen. And we work with them to go, okay, is one-to-one -one a necessity or we, can we bring that to two-to-one? But the recommendation straight out of the gate when we do the sizing is a one-to-one -one CPU ratio to give you the best performance out of the gate. I'm going to skip AES here just for a second, which is in our 5.10 release. So I'm going to go to the bottom and then I'm going to come back up. So we can do one to two indexers per node, and that's the maximum we have. And the reasoning is, is because of the actual load that's on these of these ingests and these uh, indexing pieces. So we don't want to overload. Now, with that being said is, I'm saying two indexers or one indexers, but I'm not saying that you can't run other workloads. You could put the licensing server, you could put the deployment server, you could put the deployer server on this and still use that. So you want to right size your indexers and search heads for what you're doing. You don't want to oversize it. You want to basically bring those down to where it needs to. And this is also another piece of we can work with Splunk reps or whoever in your Splunk team of architects and make this the right size. So let me come back to AO, A, the AOS AES. So we just released a 5.10.x version, 5.10.3 uh, just released a couple weeks ago. We have something called AES, Autonomous Extent Stores. What we're able to do with this piece is actually increase. This is just a software update. This is what we're good at. We're just a software company. With this software piece, I talked about that one terabyte of ingest a day. With my testing so far with 5.10 and AES, I'm seeing a two terabyte increase. So we're seeing performance on the ingest, and we're also seeing performance on the searching. That's where that 3x was coming in. It was 2x before, but that 3x is what we're starting to see today. Next, please. So who's using Nutanix? NASDAQ is, is one out there. This is one of our testimonies that we get from uh, Jake Yang. He's the Senior Director of Global Systems and Storage at NASDAQ. This is publicly available out on our website. You can actually go look at it. There's actually a short video of him talking about how they took their infrastructure from where it was in bare metal and put it in. So at a high level today, these guys are kind of on our small end or, or the starting stage of this. They've got a 1.5 terabyte ingest rate. There's about 30 nodes in their current infrastructure that's just for Splunk alone. So it's, it's a very small piece. There's two other companies that I'm going to talk about that I can't mention publicly. Uh, one is a healthcare organization. 
Uh, their current ingest is seven terabytes and over four data center, a prod and a DR, there's 140 nodes and it's a seven terabyte ingest rate, which is, which is awesome. I'm gonna go one step further. There isn't a financial firm that is not gonna be named that has a Splunk infrastructure today that is doing 23 terabytes of ingest. They're, they're hitting the 400 node limit for their cluster as of right, or not a limit. They're hitting a four no, 400 node piece for this piece. What I'm hearing, and this is coming from our sales teams and the client, is we're hearing that that's gonna double. We're talking 30 to 40 terabytes a day of ingest is what's gonna come into this financial institution. All right, James, I think it's time for a demo now. Let's see Splunk in action running on Nutanix. So this is the Cone Blueprint that we actually designed for Splunk. What I'm gonna go ahead and do is I'm gonna go ahead and kick this off. I'm going to do a launch here quick and I'm gonna come back and explain what everything is doing here. So I'm going to go ahead and label this as a Splunk test in the appliances for Comb. I'm going to give the server name of Splunk across all of these. I'll explain what that is in just a couple more minutes. And I will go ahead and give a password for the actual Splunk install itself. And here there is a piece for the Splunk license. Uh, with this demo, we're just gonna allow it to run on its 90 day trial. So I'm gonna go ahead and we're gonna create this. So we're gonna give it a couple seconds here as it queues up and it starts its building process. And then we're gonna come back through and we're gonna look at this quick of how it's actually been set up. All right, so that application's provision. Let's go back through and let's take a look of what's actually going on. In Calm, there's, there's pieces called applications as an application profile. And then there's also a piece called a service name. In Splunk, there's usually, there's three pieces, there could be four pieces, there could be more. What we're doing in this blueprint is we're taking a Splunk master node, a two Splunk indexer nodes in a clustered form and a Splunk search head, and we're creating them so they're all working together by the time this uh, blueprint is actually completed. So if you look at the blueprint, you can kind of see of the master. We've set, uh, this is gonna use a CentOS image. It's got a SCSI disk. We set this one as six CPUs and six gigs of memory. We've done a couple pieces of cloud init here. Let me go ahead and open that up. So we've done some cloud init to basically go through and set public keys, set root passwords, and create a mount point for Splunk itself. Um, each one of these pieces actually has this. Let's actually go take a look at what's actually happening on the software inside the install side as this actually comes up. So the first thing we're doing is actually adding a disk. Uh, CentOS image itself is usually a small image, could be 18 gig, could be 20 gig, but Splunk itself needs something bigger than that. You need something to store your hot and warm and your cold data. So what we do is we go ahead and we configure the disk and we go ahead and attach it to the image. Once that's been done, we go through an OS setup. In this OS setup, we walk through and it actually goes through these and I'll show you here just a couple seconds of what the commands run and what it kind of looks like, but we go ahead and we set transparent uh, use pages, uh, we set max file size, and we do a couple other things like the host name. Before I said, I set the host name as Splunk. If you see here, we use some variables that Splunk has, so we go Splunk minus, and then we create a unique number. That way, if you ever want to expand this blueprint further of adding multiple search heads, multiple masters, multiple indexers, it allows you to be able to grow that. The last piece in here is it actually goes ahead and it installs the actual Splunk piece. For those Splunk people out there, you're gonna look at this and go, okay, he's only installing 7.1.2. That's okay, but all it is is a file. It's a file that's actually coming down from Splunk. It's getting installed. Then we go through and we're setting the Splunk password. We're changing uh, variables for the op Splunk directory. Splunk start with the licensing so it doesn't prompt. We're doing starts. This bottom piece here is actually the piece that is of most importance. This is the one that's actually configuring the clustering between the two. And after that's been done, the Splunk instance has to be restarted for it to join. So by now, we should be pretty close to being able to see how close this is to up and running. So in Calm, we, it's showing its provisioning. So when you click on the launch button, you'll get the provi provisioning piece. 
we can get in here and we can kind of see, okay, it's walking through all these processes. It looks like it's actually created all three VMs and it started to create the disks and do the install packages. The services themselves, as we can see, the master node is up. Let's go to the audit section here because this will give us a little bit more detail and you can see what's going on in the back end side. So it's already gone ahead and done a lot of the master stuff. So it's gone ahead and it's provisioned it, it's checked the login. It's done the add disk commands. We're gonna go ahead and look at the master, the master package install. All right. I think it's down further, there it is. The setup OS. And here you can see the commands that we saw before were actually run on the machine itself. So you can see that even the host name itself said, okay, I need to set the host name. It created Splunk with a random numeral behind it. So the OS installed, then the Splunk install itself. There it is. Takes a little bit to load up all that information. So it goes through and it's, you can see it's doing the download of the Splunk. It's going through and actually doing the extract into a temporary directory as it comes down. And then as it gets to the bottom, it'll actually do the install itself. Let me get out of this page. And let's go back and look because the overview should show that this, this blueprint has been deployed and running without any issues. Now let's go take a look. Don't take my word for it. Let's actually see if it's actually running the way it's supposed to be. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna do a search here for Splunk, which is what we called. Looks good, we got four machines. So let's go look at the master node here. Make sure I'm right on my node, 153. As you can see, Splunk is actually up and running. Let's go ahead and let's log in. So Splunk itself is actually running. Now let's go ahead and let's, let's verify that the clustering was actually set up. So as you can see here, this cluster is actually the master node, which I picked for the reason of it would show the master node. It's actually got two peers with it. So this one's IP address is a 153. There's another one with a 152 and there's another one with a 151. So both indexers have been actually brought into this indexing cluster. This indexing cluster. And if we go here and we look at the search heads, so Splunk itself, which is this local one, acts as a search head also, which can be removed at a later time via the graphical interface. But you can also see 150 actually came up. That's that third search, that's the search head that we brought in with the Comb Blueprint. So from this place, you are ready to basically start ingesting data into your Splunk infrastructure. And that should be it. Awesome, great demo, James, thank you. Great stuff, James. Thanks for showing that demo, really gives you a feel for for what it's like to use Nutanix, right? And some of the, the benefits and things you can see uh, from just that really, that ease of use that we, that, that James talked about earlier, uh, this very, you know, graphical based uh, GUI that's gonna make it really easy to see a lot of things in one place. So you don't have to go out and assemble lots of different pieces and, and um, even have the ability to do some forecasting and planning for your growth all with it in the prison console. So we want to wrap it up, just kind of highlight a couple things about uh, Nutanix as we wrap and where you can get more information. Encourage you to check out the Magic Quadrant from Gartner on a hyperconverged infrastructure so that you get a feel for what third party firms uh, think about the offerings that are in the market there. You can see Nutanix is, is in the leader's quadrant uh, in the latest uh, paper, and they have some good things, uh, good insights that they share in that. You can find that on the Nutanix website, uh, nutanix.com slash Gartner if you'd like. Also wanted to highlight some of the value that customers have seen. All that complexity that we talked about switching, you know, and, and turning into a Nutanix HCI, you know, base cloud. Uh, these are the, the these are real world. This was IDC went out and surveyed uh, 
our customers and ask them when they made the switch, what kind of values did they see? And you can see this across three big spectrums. They're seeing value from a business standpoint, you know, from an ROI, lo a lower, 60% lower cost of operation, a very fast payback. You see, and then that plays out into operational efficiencies. So the infrastructure is cheaper, it's much easier to manage, it can be more efficient, fewer outages. So, so less downtime means more productivity. And that kind of segues into agility for IT and business results, the things that we you know, really wanted to build this around, which is how you can get that value um, by not having to build infrastructure, focus on the application, uh, we have customers actually seeing more revenue as a result of uh, switching. They're able to adapt to uh, their business demands faster, for example, have less downtime, uh, be more uh, proactive and agile. And so that's what IDC found. You can find this report. Uh, the, there's a lot more meat behind this at Nutanix.com slash TCO. Uh, and so that's out there. And then finally, here are some specific Splunk resources for you. There is a page dedicated to Splunk on our website under the Solutions tab, so you can go out there and find that. Uh, a, a great reference architecture to really, you know, if we whet your appetite with some of the, the some of the technical details of what's great about Nutanix and how you really run Splunk on Nutanix, uh, this is where all the meat is behind that. So you can go into that reference architecture. Uh, and get some more details there. And then uh, one of the things we love to do is let people take a test drive. There's the ability to do a free trial uh, online and that's at Nutanix.com slash test drive. So hopefully these will be of, of uh, help to you in your journey and I really appreciate uh, the time that Jane spent here with us and, and thank you David for everything for letting us, uh, hosting us and and making this a, a great opportunity to share some, some knowledge that'll help uh, the, the attendees uh, in their day-to-day -day job. All right, great presentation. It's time now for our prize giveaway before we jump into our Q&A. Is Amy Harris of Kentucky. Congratulations, Amy Harris of Kentucky. You won a $300 tango gift card so now it's time for some q a let's let's talk about a few questions that came in from the audience i thought of a few questions during the event uh james are you ready for some q a sure why not all right so um venkat here he's asking you know he says i know that you can mix storage only nodes and regular nodes with nutanix in a cluster is it possible to mix all flash and hybrid nodes as yeah. well and use that for splunk or is that not recommended? Yes. No, yes, you can actually do that. So the mixing of hybrid nodes and the mixing of all flash, and even going a step further of adding the storage only, we do clusters like this on a daily basis. So yes, all three of those can be mixed and matched depending on what the actual general workload is needed. Okay, cool. That's flexible. All right, another question here. Um, you know, you talked about uh, capacity and performance of you know running Splunk on Nutanix. I mean, what tools or tool would I use to manage that? And is that included when I purchase Nutanix? So there's multiple pieces here. On the Nutanix side, yes, there is a way to do this. We have a free product out there that is downloadable and installable, which we call Prism Central. Prism Central gives you the ability to see the insight into the system itself. There is actually a paid version of this that goes a step further, which we call Prism Central Pro or Prism Pro. This actually gives you what we call a runway ability. This runway ability will look at the AI behind this and go, okay, you're currently running at X for memory, X for CPU, and at your current pace as you're starting to expand or grow, you will hit the end of, end of what you have for resources at X date. It'll also give you the, ab the ability of at X date, you need to add this much if you need. So there's one other piece in here too is, okay, so if I'm going through and I'm going, okay, I've got Splunk today, I'm using one terabyte ingest, I've got this going on. I need to figure out, okay, what's it gonna take me to go to two terabytes, three terabytes, four terabytes, and even higher than that. We can actually project that out and give you a recommendation of how much more hardware you need to actually grow. So Splunk itself has its built-in tools also. So within Splunk, you can actually look at how the ingest rates are going, 
how the overall performance is, how the index is being done, gigabits per second and on like that. So there's multiple tools out there with Splunk and also with Nutanix. Okay, um, awesome. I like that that's included. So, and, and you have multiple choices available to you. Uh, I want to re remind everyone out there in the audience, now's your time to get your question in. We're just going to do a few minutes here of questions, but it, of course it depends on how many questions come in. So um, James, another question here they're asking, you mentioned the LCM update tool. What What is that exactly? <laughs> yes, I, I mentioned LCM and, and uh, I, I forgot to actually call it out of what it actually was. So LCM is called lifecycle management. Now, I call this tool out as a product or an add-in, and it's actually not. It's actually in the product itself. So when you deploy AOS and you have access to our Prism interface or even going into the Prism Central, which is the bigger piece, LCM is, is already there. It's already part of the software. That LCM, like I stated originally in the slides, allows you to update BIOSes, allows you to update uh, HBA controllers or SATA controllers or, or whatever's in the actual system and it'll actually allow the firmware on the disk too. So it's a wide variety of what it can do. It's, it's the ability to basically update everything and we take care of looking at your hardware versions and what matches and what doesn't. Very nice, very nice, okay. Uh, let's see, another question here. I mean, and I'll put my own spin on this. When I think about use cases for Splunk, I think about logging. And I, but but I'm betting there's a lot more use cases today for Splunk than just gathering all your logs in one place. Can you talk about some of the most common use cases for Splunk on Nutanix? Yes. So Splunk originally started with logging and that's kind of where it started its business. But as you know, as, as companies start to evolve and grow, you need to change your piece. So Splunk started in the logging of, let's just take these logins, we're looking for this piece, but Splunk has grown. We had talked about there's Splunk Enterprise, there's SIEM, SIEM, and then there's also enterprise security. The security portion of Splunk's business today is, is why Splunk is still here. You've got the security part. They, what Splunk does well is they create these dashboards for you within the interface that gives you what you're looking for. So if I'm a security guy, I'm looking for, okay, I've got a dashboard that shows, okay, this guy logged in six times with a bad password. Well, Thinking about that, yes, it could be a real person, but is that a hacker coming through my system? Or it's looking at firewall logs and going, oh, I see this port is getting hit multiple times. Is this someone trying to get in? Or do I have a piece of software that just hasn't been configured correctly that I need to allow that port to come through? So it's basically the eye across the whole infrastructure of logs, security, and then it can go also into the compliance piece and help you reach those goals such as HIPAA, PCI. Okay, very nice. So there's a lot more to it than than just logging today. I, I like that. And I learned that on this event, actually. So um, another question here. I mean, I, I know with any sort of event or log or security type data, I mean, it's just going to grow and grow over time. I'm curious with Nutanix, how do I scale that? Do I scale up? Do I scale out? What do you recommend? We'll hit the first question first is Splunk itself has a limit. So in its hot tier, warm tier, cold, it's got that limit piece. So you're up to a number of days that you're holding data. So when you're sizing Splunk, you size for that piece because the data is going to drop off. We, but what happens is, is now you're getting to is I started at, let's say, 600 meg of an ingest. Now I'm going to a year. Oh, yeah, by the way, Pi has come in or PCI and it says, I got to store this for seven years. So that's when you get that growth piece. So Nutanix, you start with a three node cluster because that's the minimum the way we do it. Basically, what it sits is two nodes for high availability and the third node is N plus one. So three nodes is what we start with. What happens is, is as you grow, you add another node. When you add another node, you basically add more IOPS, you add more resources, and that allows you to grow at a steady stream instead of having to go through and basically, I need a brand new SAN, I need a whole stack of servers, I need a new switch infrastructure to be able to put this in. So we provide that ability to stair-step your way in and grow at a very small level. Very nice. Okay, uh, let's see, uh, next question that came in here, um, do I need to build an island, uh, a cluster island just for Nutanix, uh, or just for Splunk when running Nutanix, or can I run other workloads in the same cluster? This is the question I always laugh at because the IT guy or 
the, the architect behind you is going to go, it depends. <laughs> so I always laugh at that question. So you can do it both ways. The first way is, can you create this island? Yes, you can create this island. If you've got something out there that's security minded. So I, I deal in the PCI world, the credit card industry a lot. That world is going to say, yes, it needs to be on its own dedicated hardware. It needs to be on its own dedicated disks. So yes, I can separate that out. In a normal infrastructure and IT organization that's using it for security and other pieces, it can all be meshed together. I had talked about a little bit before of, okay, there's two indexers and I can add this and this and this and this, but that doesn't mean I can't put a domain controller on there. Oh yeah, by the way, let me put a, a SharePoint server on there, or a web server or something like that. So it can actually be both ways, but it's really gonna depend on what security is, is holding you to and what you need to abide by for your security policies. Okay. It, it always depends, doesn't it? <laughs> yes. Yes, it does. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. I think the, the last question I have for you is, I mean, if somebody's interested in running Splunk on Nutanix, how should they get started? What's the first step they should take? To get started on Nutanix, it's, that's easy. So just learning about Nutanix itself, there's, there's multiple pieces. It's actually still up here on the screen. You can see you can go out and grab solutions briefs. You can take a test drive. Um, you can actually go out and contact us. If you go out to Nutanix.com, there's a contact button that can actually get you in touch with uh, salespeople. So if you want to start talking that, or like I said, there, there, there's plenty of resources out there. So take those and we can run with that. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I think that's all the time we have for questions. We'll give a few minutes back to uh, the folks on the event today. Go and you know enjoy your day a little bit, hopefully. Um, thanks so much for all your expert advice. Uh, for being on the event today, James. Thanks for the great demo. Um, good event. And thank you to Greg as well for his expert presentation. Uh, I think that's all the time we have. Let's see. I want to point out before we go, if you'd like to test out Nutanix and give it a try for yourself, visit Nutanix.com slash test drive. Uh, if you'd like to learn about more events from Actual Tech Media, visit events.actualtechmedia.com. Thanks for joining today's webinar on Nutanix and how to use Splunk uh, on your Nutanix infrastructure. Have a great day.